Hello and welcome. I'm Real Crowd CEO Adam Hooper, and this is the Real Estate Investing for Your Future podcast. Here we explore the latest in commercial real estate trends, insights, and investment strategies that passive investors can use to build real estate portfolios that last. All opinions expressed by Adam, Tyler, and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Real Crowd. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. To gain a better understanding of the risks associated with commercial real estate investing, please consult your advisors. Our guest today is Nate Klein, the founder and chief investment officer at One Wall Communities. In today's conversation, Nate discusses the multifamily market in an environment with rising interest rates and inflation, the balance between profitability and housing affordability, and the top things he would look for if he were investing with a sponsor. Be sure to check the show notes for links to learn more about Nate and everything One Wall is up to. We hope you enjoy today's episode with Nate Klein. Well, Nate, thank you so much for jumping on the show today. We've uh, we worked with you for, gosh, I think almost five years now in the marketplace. So uh, excited to, to finally get you on the show and learn a little bit more about yourself and, and what you guys are up to at One Wall. Thank you. It's great to be here and uh, been a pleasure working with you guys over the years. So why don't you take us back? Uh, we were just talking before we, uh, before we started, um, went to Penn State together. We were there at the same time. I don't know that we knew each other, but probably passed each other on campus at one point. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about your career in real estate? How'd you get into the business? How'd you get into real estate? Um, you know, what attracted you to this, this asset class and career? Yeah, of course. So I think the, the origin story starts even, even before college. Um, I was exposed to some sort of home construction and renovation projects over the years as a kid. Uh, and, and I um, took uh, architecture electives both in high school and college, but I was always very focused on, on business. And, and specifically when I went to university at Penn State, I was focused on going into investment banking and wanted to do mergers and acquisitions and knew that I would probably get exposed to not only real estate, but, but many other industries if I went that, that career path. And then spent a couple years as an analyst at Merrill Lynch and, and understand, you know, kind of where I wanted to go from there. Um, as it relates to real estate, I actually, ironically, my first deal that I closed at Merrill was a hotel restructuring project that was pretty interesting. And because of working on that, I got earlier exposure to the real estate sector than anybody else in the team and ended up being kind of one of the go-to analysts for M&A real estate, mm. did a pretty large transaction with Simon Property and, and Chelsea Property Group. Uh, we were selling Chelsea to Simon and worked on a number of other real estate deals, both with you know some, some folks in the M&A department as well as the heads of the M&A group and the real estate group at that time, and eventually decided that I wanted to move into private equity after investment banking, and that exposure to real estate was something that stuck in my head. And, and I was also doing a lot in industrials and, and other heavy asset, heavy industry type sectors. And that aligned really well with the job that I ended up getting after Merrill Lynch was working at Fortress as an associate in their private equity team. And they were entirely focused on asset based investing. So naturally, I was going to get exposed to real estate as well. In that we did some pretty interesting projects in terms of railroads and shipping and the the most real estate focused deal was one where we actually bought a public company that was both a, a railroad and a real estate developer um, and so we had some pretty unique uh, ideas about how we could drive value from that including using excess land and real estate right of way that the railroad owned and applying real estate development opportunities to it you know moving a rail yard from what would be very attractive industrial land near an airport mm -hmm. in Miami, um, and then eventually using excess right of way to actually create a new passenger rail um, on the uh, on the east coast of Florida. Um, so, had a lot of uh, you know cool experiences that were real estate related. Continued to to grow in interest in it, and then um, eventually, when I was working on my own, met my current partners um, who had been very real estate focused. And I was looking to either do private equity, just broadly speaking, 
or to do it within real estate. And it's because I met my partners, I chose real estate. And there we go. So it sounds like early career was more on the again, kind of M&A operating company side with a real estate component. And then how did that transition? Well, you were, you were obviously underwriting real estate as a component of those transactions. How did that transition then into what again, we were talking about before? You know, we've seen on the marketplace, uh, I think you guys have done a handful of individual asset acquisitions in the beginning and now have trans, you know, switched maybe more into fund offerings. Um, so maybe tell us a little bit about how that transition went from more operating company, M&A side of things into the individual assets and then now more into the fund space. I'm curious how that, that path has gone. Yeah, naturally I've had, you know, consistently institutional finance knowledge and experience within both, as you said, you know, fund context and company level context, started companies from scratch in private equity, have done a lot of consulting and training um, related to specific startup companies or companies of all different sizes. And when, you know, when we looked at our strategy as a firm, um, we always had pretty aggressive growth plans in mind. And when we started out, we were buying relatively small assets and the single asset model of raising, you know, a couple million bucks here and there for a deal uh, worked out quite well. Mm -hmm. um, until we were looking to scale, you know, much more dramatically and much more quickly. And so when we started getting into bigger and bigger transaction sizes, the obvious move was to develop more institutional equity backing relationships on larger deal sizes because it's just not efficient or in many cases possible from a regulatory standpoint to raise enough money on a high net worth basis to do you know 10 or 20 or 30 million dollars of equity in a large acquisition mm -hmm. um, so that 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 just lends itself to working more with larger jv partners on single equity checks but we didn't want to leave our individual investors behind we've obviously developed great relationships with hundreds of individuals over the years and have had success partnering together on many transactions and and obviously our goal is to create you know uh, perform, you know, performance for those folks that's attractive enough that they just keep coming back to us and reinvesting over and over again. And we found that there would be, you know, wide swaths of time between when we would have a deal small enough to do where we would go to that individual investor base as opposed to going to a single source equity check. Mm -hmm. And that led me to th think about how could we structure some funds that would be attractive and suitable to high net worth investors, but get them exposure to the same uh, opportunity set that, that we were um, delivering to our institutional partners uh, and do so, you know, in a way that was equivalent, you know, from a return and cash flow standpoint, but, but also give, give people the benefit of diversification across multiple deals, you know, and, and individual investors I know like to look at specific transactions and make some mm -hmm. determination about how attractive they think those deals are um, but what it comes down to for us is that we're underwriting every deal very stringently. So if we're going to do a deal, it's going to be a deal that we would have presented to anybody on an individual asset basis anyway, but for the fact that it might be 50 or $100 million purchase price, so they're never going to see it. Mm -hmm. and, and we said, how do we, how do we bridge that gap? And, and the thought was, let's create uh, a series of co-investment funds where when an investor participates in it, they know that by joining that fund, they're actually going to invest in every single deal that we're doing um, for the period of time that that fund is is open. Mm -hmm. um, and and so they do that and then they still get the same return profile and, and they get, you know, consistent cash flows and, and they get diversification. They may or may not care about, but they get it. <laughs> and, and, and it's good for everyone. Yeah. And I guess as you look at the arc of a real estate manager's life cycle, right, it, it seems to be there, there's a path there that, that normally follows that, right? Kind of start out smaller, friends and family, smaller syndications, and maybe you grow that syndication pool. And then at some point, it's almost, is it a philosophical decision as to whether or not you continue to work with uh, individual high net worths or going more the institutional route? Like how, how it, it seems like that's, again, that's a fairly common arc, right? Once you get to a certain size and you kind of forego or, or, or migrate in away from the syndicated investor base into more institutional capital. And so, how does that decision-making process play out or how has that played out in your case of, of is it truly a, 
a philosophical decision of wanting to continue to, to provide high net worth individuals? Is there an efficiency benefit, one or the other? I'm just curious how that, how that thought process goes. Yeah, I think it's, it's mostly practical in the sense that, you know, there's, there's a valuable, each party is a valuable source of equity in the right scenario. Mm -hmm. And the way that we've always looked at our deal structuring and, and our presentation of opportunities to investors is knowing that each investor has their own requirements, parameters, expectations, and so on to include naturally just def different levels of returns, um, this, the, the amount of capital they have to deploy and over what period of time and how they like to do it and so on. And we, we try to say yes to all investors in some way, shape or form, right? Mm -hmm. I don't want to turn away somebody who's interested in what we're doing, who I think can benefit from what we're doing. And, and so that's led us down the path of always considering as a strategy, you know, remains the same, but our scale continues to increase. How do you continue to attract the same and additional investors over time and, and keep all the people that want to work with us over and over again, mm -hmm. coming back to the well and able to do so. Um, and so practically speaking, you know, individual investors can only take you so far on a deal size standpoint because of the natural amounts of money that they're deploying and, you know, SEC limits on entity fundraising, you know, in terms of number of investors and, mm -hmm. and then getting into all of the other various, you know, compliance and, and management issues, right? I, I wouldn't want to have... 10 people in IR because I had to manage 10,000 individual investors, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's an unwieldy process to do so. But if I can maintain hundreds of investors with, with a more efficient staff and do more deals more frequently by coupling those folks with institutions that might write, you know, somewhere between 20 and $100 million of equity to us per year, uh, everybody's happy. Yep. Good. So now, I guess then talking about on the more asset acquisition side, one while you guys are focused on multifamily, um, let's talk a little bit about, first off, why multifamily, what do you like about multifamily? And then I think the biggest questions we're getting today from investors and listeners is inflation and interest rates, right? Those are the two big bogeys that are causing a lot of concern. So maybe through your lens of, of why you guys like multifamily, um, tell us generally what you're seeing in the space and then maybe how, how those factors are influencing or affecting how you're looking at acquisitions here going forward. Yeah, sure. So we, we like it so much. It's the only thing we've been doing for the past nine or 10 years. Um, <laughs> right. and, and, and not only that, but, but the, the niche that we focus on, which, which is now sort of, you know, colloquially known as, as workforce housing, um, has been the only thing that we've done over that period of time as well. And there are, an enormous number of reasons why we like multifamily. I'll touch on a handful and try to answer your specific question um, without having to create a second podcast for for all of the uh, <laughs> all of the reasons. But you know, we have um, going back to day one when we started investing in in this in this sector of the market. There were you know some some underlying trends that we recognized in the market, and there were a lot of demographic reasons for focusing on it. And there was an element of matching the strategy with the capital um, and, and then the ambitions that we had as a firm from a, from a growth standpoint, right? So it was a lot of different elements coming from different directions. Thinking about the trends, what, what were some of the things that we were seeing then that we're still seeing now, you know, as the, as the, the U.S., um, you know, has evolved demographically. It's led to this just tremendous supply-demand crunch for affordable housing. And, you know, within the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic where we focus, there's always been scarcity of land, um, much higher housing prices, much higher incomes as a whole relative to the averages across the U.S. It's been harder to develop and replace assets here, you know, construction and labor costs have been growing tremendously, uh, and people's wages have not kept pace with basically their ability to afford 
new construction homes or Class A apartments, which are the only two things that the real estate market in this region has been developing for, for mm -hmm. decades now. Um, and they've d been doing that fundamentally because of economic reasons, right? You just simply can't um, construct property and title property, get to a concluded open building um, in a non-subsidy environment that's affordable to the average middle income wage earner. And, and so because that supply isn't increasing, but the demand is, there's just this, this ongoing need for it. Um, and there's a lot of efficiency benefits from, a, from an operator and an, and an acquirer standpoint to be able to assemble a portfolio uh, over you know, a shorter period of time, invest capital more efficiently by buying things that are far below replacement costs, such that when you put CapEx dollars into it, you're still below replacement cost mm -hmm. and you can compete with newer product at a, at a much lower basis, um, attract you know, residents if you're trying to reposition the property or just simply be the most highly occupied, most popular spot in a submarket because it's been so well maintained and so well positioned in the marketplace. And so you know, those are some of the kind of basic reference points that, that we've had. Um, and then you know, it's, it's uh, traditionally been very efficient to finance multifamily property and, and a lot of that has to do with the the role of Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae and HUD in terms of the you know government associated enterprise lending you know benefits with you know focusing on mission driven um, affordability which lends itself to giving us more attractive financing rates which is where I start to answer your question about interest rates and how that's mm -hmm. affecting what we're doing um, you know, we, we have, because of the sector that we're working in, we seem to have access to the most efficient capital regardless of what's happening in the market in terms of better rates, better leverage, better IO, um, lower debt service coverage constraints, and so on. Um, and that's been, been the case throughout and, and doesn't show any signs of changing. And, and if anything, there's more weight being put on the affordability end of the spectrum of, of multifamily housing than there is on any of the other spectrums in terms of the agencies, in terms of governments, in terms of people wanting to support this business. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, that's very attractive for us, just generally speaking, as a tailwind for, for the opportunity set. Um, the rates have, of course, gone up, um, you know, pretty significantly in the last several months. That's had two primary impacts on us, both of which are positive. The first um, is that you already were seeing 20% increases in housing prices annually for the last couple of years through, you mm -hmm. know, starting during COVID through now. And that was making housing even more unaffordable than it already was. And here in the Northeast, we have the highest, you know, some of the highest housing prices in the country. Um, and so there was already a significant gap between the monthly cost of owning a home versus the monthly cost of renting. And on top of that, now that the mortgage rates have gone so high so quickly, um, that's impacted, frankly, the, the single family home purchaser more than it has the big institutional real estate buyer like us, right? We're still borrowing at rates that are much lower than what individuals are getting on their mortgages for their new home purchases. Mm -hmm. And when you couple the mortgage rate increases on single family homes with the price increases on single family homes, um, depending on what market you're looking at, a lot of the places where we're acquiring apartments, those monthly costs have as, as much as doubled in the last year. Um, and so if, if it was already 20 or 30% more expensive to own, now it's 100% more expensive to own. Um, and so that's led to high, very high occupancy, very tight market in terms of demand where, you know, as soon as somebody moves out, there's somebody moving in. We have mm -hmm. waiting lists at virtually all of our properties um, right now because there's just so little um, turnover happening um, despite the large renewal increases that we're getting as well. And so that's one, one item um, that's, that's benefiting us with the higher rates. The second is that it's really kind of knocked some people out of the market, right? Um, things were, were very frothy several months ago. 
on the buy side, you know, anybody that wanted mm -hmm. to invest in real estate had finally decided that yes, they were going to invest in, in apartment buildings now. And s tremendous amounts of capital chasing the deals that, that we've been analyzing has driven prices up tremendously. Um, and we were getting outbid on virtually every mm -hmm. deal by five, 10, even 20%. Um, you know, wow. up until a couple months ago. And when, when the rates kind of flipped gears and all of those weak buyers left the market um, and, and the price expectations finally started to meet the market or those sellers decided that they weren't actually sellers, right. um, number of bids went down, the market became less competitive, the only people out there selling were people that you knew actually had to sell so you could be more aggressive in terms of lowballing bids. And the other thing that happens when you see such a dramatic increase in rates um, that people don't necessarily expect is you see deals fall apart. And so we've benefited mm -hmm. from two deals coming back to us just in the last couple months where we were the second bidder and we were way off. And we're getting those deals at the prices that we wanted to pay or even a little bit below um, because of the dynamic shifting in the market. Um, yeah. And so that's that's been uh, a benefit to us. Uh, you know, I, I tell they think I'm crazy. I tell people I'm happy about everybody thinking there's a recession because uh, it's making it less competitive and easier for me to buy. So a, a couple of things here for maybe newer listeners to the show. You threw out some terms. So when when you're looking at loan terms, debt terms, um, just real quick, IO interest only. Sure. PSCR, mm -hmm. debt service coverage ratio, and then yep. where are you guys seeing rates now, maybe relative to what they were? How much of an increase are you seeing in those rates? You know, it, it depends on how you look at it. Um, the, the rates have naturally, you know, I mean, the 10 year peaked close to 340 or 350, I want to say, and it's back down to like 270 now. Um, we were, you know, we were not locking any rates um, when it was as high as it was. We, we recently mm -hmm. locked uh, the index at around 277 on a couple of our deals right now. Those have spreads of, you know, plus or minus 170, 180. So we're, we're in the low fours on fixed rate and we're still okay. in the kind of mid threes on floating, uh, mid to high threes on floating. We're not really doing floating right now primarily because the interest rate cap costs are so high, um, mm -hmm. which was, a, again, a, a kind of a, a natural outcome of the rate gyrations and the volatility and the uncertainty. Um, you know, I, I like floating rate conceptually because I actually think that, that rates are going to be trending flat to down now um, that people are acknowledging the recession. Uh, but but it's still difficult to, to do those deals because the rate caps are so costly. So if you, if you have a short term business plan with a bridge and a refi takeout, you know, a couple of years from now, which we have one deal like that, then it makes sense. If it's more of a stable existing asset, light, moderate value add, um, we're generally focusing on the fixed and baking in some kind of prepayment penalty if we think that we're going to exit, you know, on a shorter duration or mm -hmm. um, we are, you know, trying to go in lower leverage and shorter term and then and then be able to have our options open on an exit. So uh, on a relative basis, yes, interest rates have increased substantially, you know, 100 basis points, 125 basis points over where we were a little bit ago. But historically, these are I mean, this is still incredibly cheap debt. Rel yeah, I mean, I mean, we have existing it, loans on our books that are at similar rates you know, on deals that we've owned for right. a few years. So people kind of have very short memories as it relates to interest yeah. rates. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And again, I think there's, there's context of where we are overall in the bigger picture of where we've been these last few months, right? Yes, it's been pretty crazy. It's been super volatile and there's been a lot of concerns out there. But if you look at it on a little time, longer time horizon, which, you know, look, real estate is generally, we, we do look at things on a much longer horizon than most other asset classes. So good to, to see some comfort there in the fact that these are still historically really attractive financing for the properties that, that can still pencil, especially where we've seen rent growth and um, those, those demand pressures that you were talking about earlier. 
Exactly. And, and, you know, the other nice thing that I like to point out is that when you own real estate privately, it's not repriced on a daily basis like the stock mm-hmm. market is. So, you know, nobody's going into a real estate investment expecting to day trade it. And right. so if you, if you buy right and you structure it right and you capitalize it right, your holding period can fluctuate from three to 10 years, but you just pick your right time to exit and you're good. Yeah, and so I guess maybe switching a little bit more to the strategy, you mentioned a few things in there that we can maybe explore a little bit. So focused on Eastern Seaboard, uh, maybe higher income areas, more supply constrained areas. Once you've identified the markets that you're interested in, and you mentioned again, you know, a couple of these deals are falling apart, right? That, that other buyers who maybe outbid you and then their financing maybe didn't come together or something didn't work out, so you were able to pick up those deals. How do you go about sourcing and underwriting and, and figuring out the, the right business plan with those assets? Is that uh, is more science, more art, more experience, a combination of all of that? Yeah, I think it's a combination of all of that. We have the benefit of being vertically integrated and having you know tremendous experience across a lot of different um, submarkets and assets over decades of of experience. Uh, from from you know multiple different people within within the firm, both on the investment and asset management side, as well as on the property management side. So you know one thing that I think sets apart our underwriting is 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 that fact itself, right? The fact that we have the the property management and the construction management resources and folks in house um, that are you know tied with us on the investment side at the hip as we're as we're underwriting these deals. So we have a very mm-hmm. strong understanding of what it takes to operate these properties. We're not going to be relying on a third party property manager to, um, you know, operate them on a day to day basis. And 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 mind you, that that third party doesn't have an ownership mentality, right? And and we have, we even have a fund that our that our employees can invest in, so that they're they're not only ownership mentality because of the way that we're structured and culturally, but also actually. Um, so, so that's a big different differentiator. And then as we're sourcing deals, you know, naturally we're, we're a pretty sizable firm in, you know, the region. We of course have the broker relationships that we've been developing over many years. We see a lot of activity sort of pre-market. So, you know, there's there's a lot of different layers to the way that brokers go about selling properties for their clients and clients themselves have, lot, have different approaches to what they want to do. Um, you know, we have a, a few deals tied up right now. <clears throat> One of them is essentially was only shown to a handful of people and, and we were part of that handful because the broker who's engaged didn't market it widely, but but we are, you know, one of his top buyers for anything that he's doing in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And mm-hmm. so, so we got the opportunity to look at it, and 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 we won it. Um, I already mentioned the two deals that we bid on; they were marketed widely, um, but again, we were the first call when the first buyers bowed out, right? And and there may have been a couple other folks that were in striking distance of whatever that winning bid was. You know, we were either there or right below or whatever. Um, and I, I personally felt very confident that both of those deals were going to come back to us as soon as the rate thing happened. Um, mm-hmm. and, and they did. You know, we've had uh, our other, you know, two deals that are in our preferred fund. One of those was the same broker I just talked about in New Jersey, off-market scenario where the seller wanted to get out of something quietly without a process. Uh, we and the seller kind of knew each other tangentially, um, and, and that's the case as well. Like most operators of size... Um, in this region, kind of either know each other directly or have crossed paths at one way, you know, or another. Um, and it's also very important to um, to us, uh, and and has been successful for us to be the winner on a deal where we're not the highest bidder because the institution selling it is most comfortable with our sophistication and institutionalization, <laughs> right? So there's a lot of syndicators out there that that are bidding higher prices than we are and they're not getting the deals because the seller doesn't trust them to close um, Mm -hmm. or to close at the price that they're getting so that's a big element of our sourcing strategy as well is just using our reputation and our relationships to um, get better pricing and get deals that come back because they fell apart and get deals that never reach the market either because we're directly talking to the owners or because 
we have the relationships with the brokers that the owners are talking to when they're trying to do things quietly. And do you see much of a difference in strategy or, or business plan with those assets, depending on the source that you guys are finding them through? The sourcing doesn't necessarily impact that directly, but from a business planning standpoint, I would say, you know, again, something that's differentiated for us is the way that we approach our business plans and the way that we approach value add investing just generally. Mm -hmm. And so what I mean by that is the standard approach and, and the, the approach that I think investment sales brokers use in their marketing is very simple, right? It's here's the top rent in the market, renovate every unit as fast as possible to get to that rent. Right. <laughs> right. Um, and there Lower are buyers raise income and yeah, there. <laughs> yeah. And there are buyers out there that, that will say, okay, let's do that. Right. Um, and, and they're, they're, you know, flippers or traders or whatever they are. Um, and we have never taken that approach first of all, but, but more importantly, um, we are looking at a significant amount of data and analytics behind that to understand not what's the maximum rent, but what is the most appropriate rent level to mm -hmm. not have decay in the demand for that property. Um, and so that involves understanding at a very granular level who are the residents living there now? Who are the people that are going to be moving into this property if the rents are changing? And it may not be a different set of people. It may be the same people just recognizing that there's a more attractive, better standard of living at this property than the one down the street because of mm -hmm. our management and our renovations and our curb appeal and our repositioning and you know everything else that we're doing. So there's a there's an element of, of understanding that at a much more granular level that I don't think most people are getting into. Um, we are maintaining affordability, you know, even if it's not necessarily a formal agreement with some, you know, regulatory body. Uh, if I buy something that's affordable to somebody at an 80% median income level, my goal is not to make it unaffordable for that person as quickly as possible. My goal mm -hmm. is how do we manage the turnover that we expect at that property to where we can maintain very high occupancy because we're flipping units from you know move outs to to move ins very quickly and then we're taking you know an appropriate percentage of those units offline to renovate and get the bigger rent bumps and if we have 30% turnover we're probably not going to be renovating more than 10 or 15% of the units per year and I think most people underwrite things to renovate 20 or 30% of the units per year. And when you actually do the math and you figure out what's the time that that unit's gonna be offline um, and how are you gonna manage that to where you have demand for your apartments but you have nothing to offer them because everything's being renovated, right? right? And so people basically ignore the occupancy assumption despite what their renovation plan is. And we say, no, the, the occupancy is an output of how many renovations and turnovers are you doing? Um, you have structural vacancy and then you have, um, you know, the, uh, the renovation vacancy. We add those two together to get to a rational answer, not just say it's going to be, you know, 5% vacant no matter what we do. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, so there's that, you know, level of detail involved and then, uh, and then there's, there's the entry and the exit point. Right. And, and this is another one of those sort of underwriting assumptions that gets very dicey, right, is cap rate. And um, you, you know, you can make any deal work if you sell it for a low enough cap rate. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. You can, you can make any deal look good based on, on the exit, right? Yeah. So, so what are we doing? Well, predominantly, we're increasing our cap rate versus where we bought at. But more importantly, we're triangulating the exit value with other statistics that don't involve an arbitrary cap rate. What is the replacement cost percentage that I'm buying at and what is the replacement cost that I'm selling at? How does that compare to what I think the replacement cost is going to be in five years or seven years or 10 years based on you know, the, the uh, replacement cost trends and construction cost trends in that particular market mm -hmm. and the development pipeline in that market? I know how much money people are spending to build buildings that aren't gonna be open for three or four years which is roughly around the time that I'm going to be selling something that I'm buying um, based on what their 
spending on that, I know where they're going to have to sell their asset if they're a merchant developer. I know what rents they're going to have to charge. I know what rents we're going to be projecting to. And mm -hmm. I want to make sure that I'm at an appropriate discount for you know quality differences and other differences at the asset relative to the competition in the future, not just the competition today. And, and leave some meat on the bone for somebody so that if, if cap rates do stay as low as they are, then somebody else will pay me the same cap rate that I paid when I bought it. And then I'll show a really nice return um, where I under-promised and over-delivered to my investors rather than the reverse. So you mentioned something in there that I, I want to pull at and I think is a, it can be a touchy subject in, in the real estate investment world. And, and I think it's, it's, you know, it's a valid criticism, right? This balance of this is a for-profit enterprise, right? I mean, the, the goal of investing is to generate cash flow and, and wealth through through increasing the values, but maintaining that focus on affordability, right? That's, I, I think, again, a lot of the criticism of real estate managers in general in the multifamily space is, oh, they come in and they kick everybody out and they raise the rents a whole bunch and nobody can afford it anymore. And it's, you know, uh, it's a terrible thing, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you guys look at that balance? Because I think that is important to talk about and I don't think it really gets talked about a lot is those are, I mean, those are kind of opposing goals, right? Keeping affordability or addressing affordability and also generating profit, right? Yep. Increasing cash flow, increasing yep. value. Those are, those are kind of opposed goals. So how do you guys look at balancing that? Because I do think that's an important topic that doesn't really get addressed all that much in our space. Yeah, no, it's a good point. And I think, you know, they, they don't have to be in opposition if you identify the right markets and you have the right business plan and the right execution. So, you know, there are, um, there's, there's inherent risk, right, in the strategy of maximizing rents and kicking everybody out and doing the full mm -hmm. aggressive value add business plan. So I would argue that um, even when you do that, you may not, you might not be getting an appropriate risk adjusted return um, based on whatever return is being forecasted. Um, we look at it as saying, okay, our approach is lower risk and we're delivering market-based returns um, such that you know, one would look at our deals and say, you know what, this is actually a more, this is a better risk-adjusted return than that other one that I'm looking at because you guys are getting to a similar IRR and you're not kicking out the entire building in three years, mm -hmm. right? And, and all the things that go along with that. So that's one, one element of it where um, I think there is some, some alignment in a more measured or moderate approach to this than the super aggressive strategy. Um, but as it relates to the actual fundamental pricing and affordability equation, there's also the component of sustainability of those rents. And again, the, the maintenance of the value of that property, right? So you might be able to grow NOI by a certain very high percentage, but you know, bringing up the cap rate again, right? That's ultimately gonna be derived from what is the long-term growth rate potential of the income at the property. And if you've raised rent so high so quickly that you're now maxed out and you can't get any growth after that and basically everybody moves out after a year, you spend money turning over a unit and you get the same rent you had last year, um, your growth is gonna drop off a cliff and your value of that property is gonna decline um, over time or at least stay flat. Um, and so you don't want that to happen as an investor. So you do have to balance, you know, I think in some respects, again, if you have, if you have a, uh, an appropriate lens through which you're looking at your investment projections and your exit projections and so on. Um, mm -hmm. We think there's a lot of value in the people aspect of maintaining the affordability, right? Because if you're, if you're doing what we're doing and you're only really raising rents significantly on new residents that are coming in, those residents don't have any relative concern about what they were paying before because they made a decision to move into that unit at the price you were charging. Um, and so if you slowly grow that base of, of renters over time and the folks that are still there are getting reasonable increases, right? You're not just jacking up rents to get them to leave. Um, they can be happy or as happy as the person moving into the new units. And should their income support it, you know, they're gonna want newly renovated units as well. And we, mm -hmm. we, we see people coming to us and saying, hey, you know, my, but I referred my friend or my family member to the building and I just saw their unit for the first time and it's amazing. Like, how do I get one that looks like that, right? 
And, and because, again, we're not trying to overshoot the market, chances are that person who's asking us, can I get one like that, they could actually afford it. Um, mm -hmm. Because we're not going in there and saying that these units are 1,200 today and they're gonna be 2,000 tomorrow after a renovation, right? It's, it's more like the renovation premium is 100 bucks or 150 bucks. And if the average rent was affordable at, let's just use that 80% of median income reference point I mentioned earlier, well, if the person who's living in that unit is an average household, they can afford the extra 100 or 150 bucks for a nicer unit um, mm -hmm. without alienating them, without harming them economically, without kicking them out. And, and so, so rather than trying to change the, the income levels of, of the people, what we're trying to do is find markets where there's a disconnect between the in-place rents and the affordable rents with increases such that the people already living there and the people moving into that area because of migration patterns or the people that are there working and have wage growth of X percentage are um, going to be your target, are still going to be your same target audience in that market. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, there's plenty of places out there where people go and invest in things and they just, they pick the highest price point that there is, but there's no actual market for that beyond the 100 right. units that exist in that new class A building. Um, yeah, I think that's where it, it gets it, it back comes, to... It's a depth of market it, discussion. To your, right, and I think that's what you were saying before. It kind of gets back to your initial underwriting going in and digging deeper than what are the highest comps in this market to support this pro forma to target this return. It's more about, again, it sounds like you guys are going a couple levels deeper in terms of really understanding the demographics and fabric and, and what those income levels are and, and being able to deliver that renovated newer product at a, you know, not ridiculous price increase to be able to, to, to keep those folks housed. Yeah, exactly. And, and honestly, if, yeah. if that equation doesn't work, like I'm not working backwards from a return, I'm working forwards from a business case. So yeah. if, if the underwriting doesn't make sense in the deal, then the deal is one that we move on from, right? I, there's no shortage mm -hmm. of deals for me to do. We've, we've received, analyzed, underwritten several hundred deals since the beginning of this year. Um, mm -hmm. We closed one, we have several under contract. And if I, if I review 500 deals and close 10, um, I would be perfectly happy, um, you mm -hmm. know, looking back on that year. Perfect. That's, I think that's a great answer. Thank you for, for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, so switching gears a little bit, you know, if you were to put your investor hat on as an investor in, in your product, mm -hmm. um, what are some of the things that, for listeners out there, um, what are some of the things that you might be looking for knowing what you know about the business in, in um, looking at investment offerings from other managers, right? Any insights or th tips that you can share with listeners as to how to look at some of those different factors? Sure, I think, you know, I would I would focus initially more on the sponsor than the opportunity as just a simplistic um, scenario, and I would ignore the returns entirely before I understood what it was that I was actually investing in. Can you say that again, like tip, like maybe fifty times? <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, because I can, I you know, I, I'm 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 very skilled at finance. I can present any number to you and make yeah. you believe it. Um, but it's not ethical, it's not, um, it's not appropriate, right? And, you know, there's a lot more behind the curtain than what's the IRR mm -hmm. on the deal. Um, I, I think there's, and it's, you look, nobody, nobody is educated as much as all of us in the market would like them to be in in this concept of how do I evaluate risk adjusted return, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I have two degrees, one in finance and one in economics, and there wasn't a course on, you know, risk adjusted returns. <laughs> it, it, it's something that you have to uh, grasp from experience um, and from integrating all sorts of other data points into analyzing a particular opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think it's, it's really, um, uh, it, it, you know, if you talk, if you ask the same question to 
let's say a, a venture capital investor, right? Like they might even go so far as to tell you, I don't care what the business is. If I trust and believe in the founder, that's enough. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so that's, we've we've long been proponents on the on the show. If you, you pick the jockey, not the horse, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so so understand. I you know I think so so putting a, a you know um, putting a cap on that. I would the last thing I would say is just like buy into the strategy before you buy into the deal, right? Mm -hmm. Does the th does the thesis make sense? Does the math make sense? Do the assumptions make sense? Um, do you trust in the ability of the sponsor to execute and deliver what you're saying, what they're saying? And do mm -hmm. you feel like you're taking an appropriate amount of risk for what you're getting in return? Yeah, and that's that's something that's been. Um, you know, a, a challenge or behavior that we've seen certainly on the marketplace, right, is is definitely chasing returns, right, and that's that's kind of the prime, the primary focus rather than necessarily digging in on some of those deeper points and really understanding the strategy behind that. You, you know, I think it's easy to get um, attracted by a big number mm -hmm. without necessarily doing the dig in to to really understand the the fundamental oppor opportunity underlying. So I think that's great advice, and definitely um, agree with you on that one for sure. Great. Um, okay, so let's let's kind of wrap it up here. Um, we've we've certainly taken uh, we're at the end of our time limit here, forty five minutes in. Um, why don't you just tell us real quick you know, when you're looking at real estate data out there for some of the listeners, what are some of your most uh, turned to or trusted um, resources for data when you're looking at new markets or, or different acquisitions? So, I mean, it, most of the data that we use is is subscription based. Um, so I don't know how many individual investors are going to be able to mm -hmm. access what, what we're looking at. Um, but I would emphasize that um, most of that, that data is ultimately sourced from you know, either, either government data or other reputable data gathering sources as opposed to mm -hmm. just journalistic or sponsor driven articles and white papers. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so I would encourage people to focus on the the source of the data, um, more so than the data itself. Um, and you know, I, I was just, you know, for example, and, and this is like, you know, fa fairly esoteric, but like the the Fred dot St. Louis, uh, uh, Fed Gov site, <laughs> right, um, mm -hmm. is a great place to see charting of all of the government data in, in one place, right. And right. so when we're looking at you know, comparisons between regions and locations. Um, it's very, it's a very easy place that's publicly, publicly available to listeners um, to, to look at, you know, quarter over quarter changes and in incomes and, and housing prices and so on, detached from whatever the, uh, whatever journalistic bias might otherwise be attached yeah, yeah, to it. Editorialization in, of it. Yeah. In, in an article, yeah. Yeah, we're uh, big fans of Fred as well. Tons of good data in there. Um, we'll, we'll put links in the show notes to, to those as well for anybody that wants to go poke around. Um, okay, final three questions here. What, uh, what has you most worried or concerned right now about either real estate in general or, or what you guys focus on with multifamily? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic in general about our uh, about our industry and about you know the opportunities that that lie ahead, um, you know, biggest concerns are, are 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 generally always tied to regulatory situations, right? Uh, and mm -hmm. and it's and I, I'm not I don't have anything to point to specifically. It's just it's just the unknown, right? And so mm -hmm. the best example I can give is like make sure you're not getting yourself into an investment that is going to be impacted the way that rent stabilized housing was impacted in New York City when <laughs> when mm -hmm. the political environment just did a 180 and completely destroyed the business plan of every operator of value add rent stabilized housing in New York City, right? Yeah. So only 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 those types of governmental or regulatory bodies really have the in my opinion the the power or ability to 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 harm the sector um, as long as people are mostly hands off uh and it'll it'll take care of itself and, and do very well okay 
Well, the follow-up to that one is uh, what has you most optimistic? Uh, it sounds like you maybe got a, a dose of optimism there. So why don't you share what, what you're looking forward to the most or what has you most optimistic about the space? Yeah, I, th I think just um, one of the things is just the realization among the investor community and I think the public at large that there are really exciting opportunities to invest in private real estate and to, you know, do well while doing good in this, from the standpoint of like the ESG, ESG mindset and the affordability mm -hmm. things that are going on. Um, we, we see a lot of opportunities, you know, to be able to perhaps, you know, get involved in more public private partnerships in the space and, and, um, not really change our, our return expectations or our results, but, but have recognition that, hey, this is actually something that's a really interesting investment and it's also something that is supporting a dire need <laughs> in society um, to be able to make sure that, uh, you know, that, that everybody's living in, a, in an attractive home. Perfect. Well, Nate, uh, this has been a fantastic chat. Uh, why don't you let listeners out there know how they can learn more about what you guys are up to with One Mall? So they're more than welcome to check out our, our website, um, onemallcommunities.com. Uh, we always are posting news on there about what we're up to. There's an investor page, uh, more information about our strategy and our team. And uh, we tend to, um, you know, anybody that wants to be kind of uh, marketed to or, or ask questions, there's, there's an ability to send us feedback and questions through that page and so on. So, Perfect. Well, again, we'll have links in the show notes for all of that. So uh, again, really appreciate your time and, and thanks for, for sharing your thoughts with us today. Great. Thank you. It's a pleasure. All right, listeners, that's all we've got for today. As always, if you have any questions or comments, send us a note to podcast at realcrowd.com. And with that, we'll catch you in the next one. <laughs> <laughs>